people in some ways are like all other creatures. We share a basic biological predisposition towards self-preservation in the interests of survival and reproduction. But what makes us unique is we've got this ginormous forebrain. And this allows us to do a lot of things, including think abstractly and symbolically, to the point where we're literally able to create things that don't even exist or to think about them and then actually create them. Uh, we can think about things that have happened in the past, even before we've ever been here. We can think about things that might happen in the very distant future, and we can imagine ourselves in an infinite number of potential or possible scenarios. If you're smart enough to know that you're here, uh, you necessarily realize that you will someday die, that you could die at any time for reasons that you could never anticipate or control, or that from a purely biological point of view, you're no fundamentally more significant or enduring than a lizard or a potato. You wouldn't be able to stand up uh, in the morning if that's all you thought about. What our ancestors did rather ingeniously, albeit quite un unconsciously, is to solve the problem of how to manage the existential terror that is engendered uh, by the awareness of death, which is in turn an unanticipated byproduct of our vast intelligence through the construction and maintenance of what the anthropologists call culture. Humanly constructed beliefs about the nature of reality that we share with other people uh, that minimizes death anxiety by giving us each a sense that life has meaning and that we have value. All cultures provide an account of the origin of the universe. All cultures have prescriptions for how we should behave while we're here. All cultures have some hope of immortality, either literally through the heavens, souls, reincarnations, and afterlives of the world's great religions, or symbolically, you may realize that you won't be here forever, but you're still comforted by the possibility that a vestige of your existence will persist over time, perhaps by having children, by amassing great fortunes, uh, by writing great books, or maybe making great works of art or scientific discoveries. <laughs> The first component of terror management theory states that individuals need to sustain faith in a meaningful worldview. The second component states that individuals need to feel as though they are valued protected members, objects of significance within this worldview. Psychologists would generally call this self-esteem. And if we can sustain these two psychological constructs, then we can function relatively securely in the world and if these if these constructs are threatened then we're going to feel anxiety and have a need to defend those constructs so we develop what we call the mortality salience hypothesis and all that says is look if culture serves a death denying function then if you remind people that they're going to die that should momentarily really increase the need for the death-denying aspects of their particular beliefs about reality and that should be reflected by their reactions to other individuals who either bolster or support those beliefs or who undermine those beliefs by either being hostile to them or merely different from them. The very first study that we did was with municipal court judges in, in Tucson, Arizona. Judges have a kind of clear set of values that are part of their worldview, and that is to uphold the law. And so what we thought is that if we make some judges think about their own death, they should become more punitive toward a lawbreaker. So half the judges, on a random basis, were given questionnaires that asked them about their own death. Half were not given such a questionnaire. And then we had them actually look at uh, an actual court case. The most common case uh, in municipal court in Tucson is uh, solicitation of prostitution. They were simply asked to recommend a bond for the prostitute. Okay. What we found is the judges who were reminded of their own death before setting bond for the alleged prostitute recommended a bond of $455. The control judges who were not reminded of their own death set a bond, an average bond, of $50. Uh, we do agree that, for them, that we don't think about death all that much consciously. 
in our daily lives. Uh, most psychological activity is quite unconscious. We repress our concerns about death and our thoughts of death, but it's underneath. It's outside of consciousness. When people are reminded of their mortality, for example, by completing a death anxiety questionnaire, or being interviewed in front of a funeral parlor, or even exposed to the word death that's flashed so rapidly on a computer screen, 28 milliseconds, that you don't know that you've even seen anything, uh, when people are reminded of their own death, Christians, for example, become more derogatory towards Jews, and Jews become more hostile towards Muslims. Germans sit further away from Turkish people. Americans reminded of death become more physically aggressive to other Americans that don't share uh, their political beliefs. Iranians reminded of death are more supportive of suicide bombing and, and they're more willing to consider becoming martyrs themselves. Americans reminded of their mortality become more enthusiastic about preemptive nuclear, chemical and biological attacks against countries who pose no direct threat to us. The uniquely human fear of death also contributes to environmental problems by fostering discomfort with nature. After all, everything in nature is of finite duration and will eventually decay and die. And laboratory studies confirm that intimations of mortality increase our contempt for and disregard of nature. After thinking about their death, people deny that humans are animals. After thinking about their death, people have more negative attitudes towards animals and consider it more appropriate to kill animals for reasons other than food and medical research. When people are reminded of death, they become more uncomfortable with their own bodies, including basic biological functions. Uh, even sex becomes more aversive after one is reminded of death. Death reminders also make people more uncomfortable in natural settings as opposed to cultivated surroundings and more willing to exploit natural resources such as forests for personal gain. When people are reminded of their mortality, they are very uncomfortable in nature. There's some Dutch psychologists that I like a lot and they showed Dutch people pictures of forests and pictures of suburban neighborhoods with lawns and stuff. And what they found is that in controlled conditions, the Dutch participants liked the forests more than the suburban neighborhoods, but when they were reminded of their mortality, uh, they liked the neighborhoods better than the forest. There's a strong positive correlation between death anxiety and materialism. That is, people with high death anxiety tend to be much more materialistic. Secondly, following death reminders, People have higher fiscal aspirations and say they intend to spend more uh, on clothing and entertainment. Death reminders also make people yearn for high status luxury goods like Lexuses and Rolexes. And after thinking about their own death, people ask to draw pictures of coins and dollar bills, actually draw bigger images. Money literally looms larger when death is on our minds. And really interestingly, after just handing people some money and having them count it, uh, people's death anxiety is reduced. Throughout vast ages of prehistory, mankind imagined that it could give and control life. Think about what that really means. With the techniques of ritual, people imagined that they took firm control of the material world and at the same time transcended that world by fashioning their own invisible projects which made them supernatural, raised them over and above material decay and death. Ritual is actually a pre-industrial technique of manufacture, not so much of material objects bit of life, of the things of the world that use the dimension of the invisible. Man controls nature by whatever he can invent, and primitive man invented the ritual altar and the magical paraphernalia to make it work. When we became self-aware, we became aware of the end of self, of our animal insignificance and finitude and this led to a crippling anxiety 
that we had to counter by creating culture, that is, activities and beliefs that would give us the illusion that we are persons of value in an enduring world of meaning. This byproduct of self-awareness came to assume a central role in human behavior, rendering older functions like our ape hierarchies, our morality, sexuality, and intelligence subordinate to it. That is, making them bound by culture, which through self-esteem would work constantly to push our fears into the deep recesses of the unconscious. But without a culture providing a great sense of cosmic significance, humans could not successfully quell their death anxiety and achieve satisfactory self-esteem. The shift toward surplus and materialism in civilization meant that our previous sense of cosmic significance and literal immortality was undermined. Whereas primitive religions are deemed to have provided great cosmic significance to everyone in the tribe, it subsequently came to be concentrated in elite figures like pharaohs and kings, with delayed and conditional otherworldly rewards for the rest of the population. This left the world in a chronic state of deficient self-esteem. With a predictable increased search, invention and emphasis on less fulfilling, more earthly sources of personal significance and symbolic immortality or legacy. This includes things like national identity, money, progress, jobs, hobbies, and inflation of celebrity figures, as well as of day-to-day -day triviality. A central property of these human sources of self-esteem is that they constitute narrow focus strategies what Ernest Becker called fetishes. Since we are insignificant in the big scheme of things, we focus on a small or narrow aspect of real or invented reality where we can more easily gain a sense of personal significance. This unfortunately made us oblivious and intolerant of other realities including the broader realities that would allow a more rational, less destructive appraisal of the world. Our cultural fetishes gave us blinders and came to assume a life of their own, leading to a self-perpetuating process of competition for the scarce cultural resources that would grant us self-esteem. This, in turn, led to a deep immersion into a series of unpredictable technological developments, radically changing our societies and natural environments in unforeseen directions, culminating in the creatively exploitative thoroughness of modern progress. With the idea of progress, we sought what theists found in the idea of providence, the promise of a bright future, an assurance that history would not be meaningless. The idea that history is cyclic can render any progress obtained meaningless, because then, ultimately, there is only moral gain and loss. We did not want to be confronted with regression and wanted to believe that history is not cyclic, but progressive. Indeed, moral progress, believing that 
we've come a long way despite our destruction of other species imbued the course of history with meaning with recent reports of 58 percent of the earth's surface featuring unsafe levels of biodiversity compromising things like future food production nutrient cycling and pollination compounded on the effects of global warming the long-term survival prospects of humanity today are actually worse than they were in prehistory so that all the marvels of modern technology might have only served to provide increased longevity and material resources to a few overpopulated generations of humans at the expense of perhaps hundreds of thousands of billions of humans in the future. A number perhaps only achievable by small but countless generations of hunter-gatherers living sustainably. The attempt to achieve symbolic immortality through progress will have in fact produced the opposite effect. A vast increase in mortality, perhaps leading to the extinction of the human species.